Hi, everybody. I'm Fred. I am a founder. I've started a few companies, um, Hopper, which you might have heard of, but also now Deep Sky. And I was invited today to give the single worst keynote you will ever hear in your life, which we've titled The Collapse of the Global Carbon Cycle. The Earth has warmed one degree since the beginning of the industrial age. Everybody knows this in this room. Everybody understands it. And it is warming because of CO2, other gases, but mostly CO2. There's currently 421 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is like the chlorine in a pool. You have 400 molecules of CO2 for a million of everything else. We know this because in Hawaii, there's a, a piece of equipment on Mauna Loa that's been measuring CO2 since the end of the 1950s. It was put there by Charles David Keeling, and it gives us something that we call the Keeling curve. So the Keeling curve measures the CO2 every year, except that one year in the pandemic, it's been going up. And we're used to seeing the curve like this. But I'm a data guy, and one question that I ask myself is, what happens if I look back in time? So if you pull back 10,000 years, we do this with ice core data in the Antarctic, you pull the core out, you can get a measurement of historic CO2, the curve looks like this. And so Al Gore showed this in 2003, for those of you who like me are old and know who Al Gore is. Um, and you get a chart that looks like this, and this is a pretty weird chart because of the acceleration, the velocity in the last 100 years. So we asked the question, can we look backwards even more. This is a million years, right? So note that modern man only appeared in the last third of this chart. And you see there's an actual ebb and flow of CO2. Climate deniers were actually using the natural increase in the last century to demonstrate that there was a natural process. And there is, but the planet really wants to stay between about 180 and 280, not even close to the 400 we're at now. Why does it flow? It depends on the axis of rotation of the Earth, and fun fact, which part of the galaxy the solar system is. If we're in an arm where there's more stars, there's more cosmic rays, and that actually warms the Earth over tens of thousands of years. So, but looking at this, the state that we're in today is kind of scary, because there's no historic comparison. So I wondered, could you look back? Turns out you can. So this chart actually has another 100 million years in the darker part that you see to the left. And this is geological data. So there's a particular type of snail that falls to the bottom of the ocean, and by measuring something in the, the Discovery Channel stuff that you can imagine, uh, scientists were able to get a historic record of the approximate CO2 in the atmosphere. Those are the blotches that you see in the background, and they're able to trace a trend line. Now, for those of you who don't know, 50 million years is Jurassic Park. There's a T-Rex, but that's a logarithmic scale. At minus 3 million, there are no dinosaurs. There's some woolly mammoths, but you're basically looking at the same continents. And you find a period where there were 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. It was called the mid-Pliocene warm period. There were palm trees in the Antarctic. We know this because we found the fossils. You can actually Google this. The actual temperature of the planet was a full three to five degrees warmer, which is pretty strange. What else can we know about this period? Well, actually, shorelines are easy to trace because they leave a geological record. And in 2003, in the New York Times, research was published where somebody traced the shoreline of the east coast of the United States all the way back to the mid-Pliocene. The shoreline was a hundred miles inland, which would require in Florida 20 meters of water and in other parts, 60 meters of water. So you ask the question, is that even possible? Well, it turns out we know. If you calculate the exact amount of water that you get, if you melt Greenland and Antarctica, sea levels will rise by 58 meters, not 58 feet. This is not with future emissions. It's the current state of the atmosphere as I stand here today. This is the IPCC models that you're used to seeing. They talk about these various scenarios, they talk about staying under two degrees, and there's a huge discrepancy here because they're basically saying that we can go up to a thousand parts per million 
to be at five degrees, but we can still continue to emit CO2 to 500 parts per million, and we have a chance at staying at 1.5 or 2 degrees. Yet the historical record says the last time we were at current day concentrations, all the ice had melted and the Earth had warmed 5 degrees. What gives? Well, here's something that I learned. There's a delay. When you put up CO2 emissions, the concentrations are immediate because you're putting up molecules. But the relationship between CO2 and warming isn't instantaneous. The CO2 itself doesn't create a patch of warm air. It's very complicated, right? It has to do with greenhouse gas emissions, the albedo effect. But there's a general consensus that it takes 50 years between the time where we emit a ton and we feel the effects. Which means that what we're seeing today the drought in California, the fires in Alberta, those rivers that ran dry in Europe where there was something called a hunger stone that peered out, that's not for 421 parts per million, that's for the concentration when I was born, roughly 320. We have not started to experience the effects of what we've already done, of the CO2 that's there today. The second thing that's terrifying is that unlike methane that'll get destroyed within 12 to 16 years, it reacts with solar radiation, the CO2 is this big, ugly, heavy molecule and it stays up there. It actually stays up there between 300 and 10,000 years. So we are stuck with this concentration, even if we shut down the economy today, start riding horses and hunt our food, plus everything we put up there. Now we reach the single worst slide that anybody will ever show you in any presentation. It's called the global carbon cycle. I thought that all the CO2 that was up there we put up, which is stupid because everything is made of CO2. Trees are made of CO2, we're made of carbon. And so there's actually a global cycle. And here's how it works. The earth, everything that's alive, the plants, they draw down CO2. Again, error bars on this, but roughly 450 billion tons a year. But when a tree burns or it dies, it decomposes and it emits CO2. And actually, trees do this at night naturally. The ocean is actually the world's largest store of CO2. And because of something called Hensry's Law, gas that is soluble in water can come in and out, in gassing, out gassing. That's how you get Perrier. Well, the ocean actually emits about 300 billion tons and captures about 300. And we, as a species, we put up about 33 billion tons. And let's be clear, a ton's a ton. It's an actual ton of material, it's just in the form of gas. So, two things. First of all, notice the balance is negative. The Earth is removing every year about 17 billion tons of the 33 that we put up. So we're not feeling the full effects. Second, until we reach 17 billion tons, we had no effect. But that's not what's scary here. The planet circulates 750 billion tons of CO2 annually. What if we break that cycle? What if that gets deregulated? The minus 17 could become zero, it could become plus 17, it could become plus 100. At which point, what we do as a species no longer matters. Can we break this carbon cycle? Is that even possible? Well, think of it this way. Think of an ice sheet. This is the Larsen B ice sheet, the largest chunk of ice to ever melt. It fell apart in 2003 and 2001. Once that is gone, if I stop emissions, or even if I magically cool the temperature of the planet by one degree, does it come back the next year? Of course not. It's going to take 10,000 years, right? So every time that we have a step function, we're breaking something bigger than our own civilization. Here's another version of it. Rainforest dieback, the Amazon. Everybody knows the Amazon is a carbon sink. It absorbs CO2, right? Well, actually, if you break it up, the Amazon is on multiple countries. The part in Brazil has been very poorly managed. And you actually see here chart, because they've been collecting this data in real time for 20 years, of what the Amazon draws down, the green, what it emits, the red, and the white is the balance. The Amazon as a whole is still a tiny bit negative, but look in Brazil. That part is actually emitting more CO2 than it captures today. Ocean outgassing. 
This is an at scale chart of how much CO2 is everywhere. The red is the fossil fuel reserves. Land is all the CO2 that's absorbed by all the land mass on the planet, all the plants. What's in the atmosphere and blue is the ocean. There are 38,000 billion tons of CO2 stored in the ocean. For each one degree of warming of the surface, the ocean will outgas 50 to 80 billion tons. So these are called climate feedback loops. You can find them in the IPCC reporting. And what they are are the natural systems that regulate the planet, what I was showing at the beginning of this presentation. All nine of them are broken as of this year. These have been talked about. They've been talked about tipping points. And so the big question is, all of this forecasting we're getting at two degrees, is it real? Well, the models don't include the forcing functions. It's all linear. All we're doing is forecasting what's happened before and saying, if the trend continues, it'll go this way. Why are they doing that? It's not because the scientists are stupid. It's not because there's a conspiracy to lie to us. It's because you can't forecast losing the Amazon. We have no data. You cannot build a model for something that's never happened. So we hit this question. Not only you can ask, are we going to break the carbon cycle? but have we broken it already? Because there's a 50 year delay. So there's a way to look at this. Everything I've discussed up to this point are causes. Here's the consequences. Let's look at the effects of global warming as they're known, right? And we did something very simple. We drew a trend line in Photoshop. There's nothing complicated in this chart. This is surface warming, the average temperature of the planet. You will notice something. If I sample the data, from 1850, the beginning of this, and I draw a full trend line, the Earth should have warmed 0.1 degree. Something happened in the 1980s. You can see the slope is completely different. If I draw the trend line with just that data, we've warmed a full one degree. So since the 1980s, the rate of warming has accelerated tenfold. And actually, if you look at this chart, you could argue something really terrifying happened in 2015, because then the data set actually peaks up even harder. So you get what I'm doing here? Let's go through it. Sea temperature rise. If I sample the whole data set, we should have seen 0.2 degree of warming. We're at 0.8, four times faster. The dislocation, 1980. Sea level rise. So warming air is much easier than warming water. You can basically see we should be at 150. We're at 300 millimeters twice as fast, dislocation, 1990. Frequency of tropical storms. I don't think I have to explain this one, 1995. Forest fires, every year is a line. This is the US, this is Australia. So, have we broken the carbon cycle? Probably, right? So we actually believe that we are currently at five degrees with all of the implications. Now, what does that mean? Flooding, storms, that's not the immediate threat. The immediate threat is agricultural collapse. So this is a chart that has two parts to it. The bottom is how wet a year was in the United States. If the bar is negative, it was drier. I've also highlighted that in red. At the top, you actually see agricultural yields per acre. You'll notice when there's not enough water, things don't grow. And by the way, we grow most of our food in the desert. You'll also see that starting in 2000, the frequency of this drought becomes continuous. There's actually no more wet years. This is from the USDA, United States government website. They are forecasting a loss of agricultural productivity between three and 92% in most of the places where we grow the food and we grow the things that we feed to the animals that we eat. This is a picture that was taken by a friend of mine three weeks ago, Ron Herson, in the San Joaquin Valley. So if you go to San Francisco and you cross the mountains and you drive down, this is where we grow the almond trees and the fruit trees to make all the stuff that we eat and other crops. And as you, you might've heard, there's a drought. The Hoover Reservoir is actually about Deadpool. They are uprooting the trees. This is an actual picture that was taken three weeks ago. This is not in the future. You can drive for three hours and see this across the road. I dare you to go do it. 
And actually, California is forecasting that they're going to see a drop between 5 and 20% of every crop that we eat. And of course, because we already have broken the carbon cycle, it's already started. This is wheat and corn. Global productivity is down 4 to 5% already. India, the world's second largest producer of rice, banned the export of wheat and rice last year. Now, this is what happened in 2022, the first really global drought that we had. California lost 800,000 acres. The floods in Pakistan, um, they actually killed 800,000 heads of cattle, plus 2 million acres, and cereal production in Europe is actually down by 30%. Why? Because when a river runs dry, what happens at the end? The ocean comes in and it goes into the fields. You're literally salting the earth. They're called hunger stones for a reason, right? So all of this happened for the first time in 2022. Now we're hitting the most important part of this problem that's most difficult to understand. It is an exponential problem, just like a pandemic. Maybe some of you remember this, how well we manage the pandemic. In exponential math, human beings evolved as hunter-gatherers. We're really good at seeing movement but we're terrible at exponential math. I'll give you the example. Take a lake, a very large lake, that's getting covered by an aquatic plant. The plant doubles every day. It takes 50 years for the lake to get covered halfway. It's a big lake. How long until the lake is entirely covered? One day. That's how bad we are at exponential math, because it goes 25, 50, two days, you're done. Now, if there's exponential math, and we lost 4 million acres last summer, and it starts to compound, that goes 16, 32, so on and so forth, within five years, you have global agriculture instability. Am I saying that's happening for sure? I have no idea, but I'm saying all the curves that I showed you of the effects show the beginning of an exponential inflection which is totally different than a linear problem. The CO2 has been accumulating linearly. We broke the carbon cycle. The earth is starting to become unstable. The consequences will be exponential. So now that I've scared all of you, I'm gonna insult a whole bunch of you that are trying to work on climate by saying that the only things that matter are what on this chart. We re-ran the math and you can frame the problem this way. We will have to take out every ton of CO2 that we put up, all of it, because the earth has to come back to the state it was in before the industrial revolution. Now, let's say that I had all the money in the world to do this. All the world banks gave me all of the money. We don't have the energy reserves to do it. Second, we have to stop emitting. We can't get off fossil fuels immediately unless you're actually willing to ride a horse and hunt your own food. So we're gonna to have to take every ton of CO2 that we're putting up while we're doing this transition and bury it. Because it is 50 times more expensive in dollars and in energy to take it out of the atmosphere. There's a fake debate about should we capture CO2 or pull it out? We have to do both, we have no choice. Then we have to stop cutting down all the trees and we can't own our own cars. So if you look at the only things that will actually put a dent in what's happening now, you need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Deep Sky is a company to do this. I'll give you a two second over that. We will need massive investment in nuclear. Yes, I said nuclear. Do we do renewables? Yes. There's not enough surface area in Australia to generate the energy with solar panels if you covered the entire continent to be able to pull the CO2 out. This is how bad this problem is. China actually gets it because they have 192 nuclear power plants that they're building currently. So that's going to have to happen. Luckily, there's a new generation. We have to do reforestation and vehicles have to be electric and autonomous. Now let's look at the CO2 curve. This is what it looks like. A thousand ppms if we do nothing. I think everybody agrees this is going to be a catastrophe. What the IPCC is saying is if we decrease our emissions over the century, we're good. I disagree because you land at 500 parts per million. And again, the last time that that happened, we think you have to start pulling out to end the century at 330 parts per million. 
To be clear, what I'm describing is building an industry from scratch that is a multiple of the size of the entire oil and gas industry in the next 20 years. This will be without a doubt the largest endeavor that humanity has ever undertaken if we decide to do this. Now, that actually means that you need to have geology, you actually need to have the ability to pull CO2 out of the air and the ocean simultaneously. The good news is this technology exists. The first time that we captured CO2 and put it underground was 1972. We can scale this, but we have to believe that the problem is real and it's urgent. What this is, is a terraforming company. If you're gonna pull out 800 billion tons of something from the atmosphere of a planet, you're terraforming it. Elon Musk wants to go do this on Mars. I propose we start with Earth, where we currently live. Another way to think of this is, it's an oil and gas company running backwards. It's pulling it out, compressing it, putting it back underground. No, you can't make biochar or cement at this scale there's no scale of any industrial product that gets even close to 800 billion tons. This is what it could look like. We are trying to build this first thing in Quebec because regardless of all the details, there's enough energy to power millions of tons of removal. How you can run it at night, where our consumption is the third, that's just one way of doing it. You need to pull out from the atmosphere, you need to pull out from the ocean, and you need to sequester it geologically. This is what Deep Sky is. We've just funded the company. For scale, this is what a 100,000 ton facility would look like. The technology exists. We've already pre-purchased the licenses. And this is what a 200,000 ton facility that can pull out from the atmosphere looks like. Now, in order to meet the need to pull out what's there and what we're putting up at the current rate, even if every country hits their commitments, we will need 2,000 plants of this scale. This is how large the endeavor is going to be. Right, so a couple of things here. There's a general understanding in climate that if you go too negative, people will just give up and be dismodent. I refuse that statement. If there's a true emergency, sometimes the correct action is panic. I build companies for a living, sometimes panicking is the correct action to what's going on. And I personally don't believe that if you tell somebody it's gonna be bad, they're automatically gonna give up. Talk to any 25 year old, nobody believes the official narrative anymore, nobody. They all know instinctively something terrible is going to happen. So will it be bad? Yes. Will people starve? Yes. Will people die? Yes. Have we left the world in a materially worse state for our children than what we inherited? Absolutely. But I do not believe that an uncontrolled collapse of agriculture is the right way to land this. I think we can do better. And humanity hasn't been defeated yet. And I think we can actually take on and do this. So we're doing our part. I encourage you to do the same thing. And I want to close on one last thing. The indigenous nations of the world have told us this for 300 years, and we didn't listen. Maybe this time, the consequences of this will be so terrible economically and socially that as a species, we will learn to never do this again once we're on the other side of it. Thank you.